welcome to Character Creation Cast, where Ryan and I are very upset to find out. <laughs> We're just, just diving right in. Diving, no. diving right oh. in. Where Ryan and I are really upset to find out uh, that LMFAO is A, no longer together. <laughs> B, Party Rock came out in 2011. <laughs> Yep. Uh, and that LMFAO claims that they've been doing this forever, quote, like four or five years. Uh, <laughs> so here we are, everyone, celebrating four years together, doing better Wait. than LMFAO. It's That's our true. four year Q&A episode, part three. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. Um, Please leave all gosh, that in. <laughs> gosh, what an intro. What an intro. Uh, we've got an energy today. We're recording in the morning on a uh, Memorial Day day. Uh, <laughs> Monday, Monday morning. Yep. Uh, so uh, welcome, everybody uh, from the future. Uh, we're really happy that you were able to join us uh, for this uh, off the cuff Q&A session. Um, we'll try to keep it uh, within an hour and a half, but uh, we're, we're a little slap happy this morning, but uh, it's fine. It's fine. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. We're doing our best. Uh, doing should our I best. put the timer on? I feel like that worked pretty well for us last time. It did. Okay. Yeah. All right. How many questions do we have to do today? I think there's like 20, right? Uh, something like that. All right. Some of them might be pretty fast, but uh, we got 23 questions. 23 questions. How many did we get through last questions. time? Okay. So the first time uh, we got through 16. Yep. And then the next and time, the we second got time we got through eighteen, but like two two extra ones were double, so sixteen again. Okay. So we'll see if we can get through another sixteen or more. I mean, whew, here we go. Ready? Ready? The... I forget who's even who's, who's odds. Uh, well, last time you said I was odds. That's so true. Let's that's just go fine. with that. I, I, I mean, I was I'm fine listening. being the odd one. <laughs> I was I was listening to our our backlog of, of bonus content that you can catch up on in the the patreon uh that we have going on right now it's interesting because well, i think it was hero dog saves town or no it was some game that we did together and i was like okay i'll be evens you be odds and you're like that's all you need to know about us right right <laughs> that just that's that's it right i like there. that i continue to make the same joke i'm nothing if not consistent it's fine it's yeah great. it's great I am looking right. at my screen as if I'm I'm seeing you when I'm talking to you, but actually I just am looking at my waveforms. So now I'm actually looking at you. Um, <laughs> Welcome. Do you like how I faked that though? Like yeah. I was paying attention. Okay, so does that mean I get to go first? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. All right. So this question, first one for the day, is from Derek D. Best non-Eurocentric fantasy game. Ooh, I like it. Yeah. Um. Gosh. I'm trying to think like fantasy because I like we've covered non Eurocentric games. Um, I'm trying to think like specifically fantasy though. I mean, it is difficult because like the fantasy genre traditionally was born out of that European. Yeah, what we mindset, what we traditionally right? equate with fantasy. Yeah, is, right, right. Is... I I haven't um, been able to read any of it yet, but from what I've seen of the materials, the promo materials and stuff, uh, uh, what is it? Coyote and Crow. Yeah, Coyote and Crow mm -hmm. um, looks fantastic. Yeah. Um, and that is um, yeah, a lot of Native American influences in this one, um, and the uh, the art is just gorgeous. Uh, from what I hear, the game is uh, pretty fantastic, um, and the book is. Just enormous. It's a huge book. 472 uh, full color pages with like, it's just, it's hefty. It's, it's nice. It feels, it feels good. Um, and it's got, it's got a lot of uh, very cool concepts from what I saw from the, from the, uh, the Kickstarter and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are a number of good um, D and D settings two that have uh non eurocentric feels um i'm going to probably like pronounce this wrong um because it's i want to pronounce it in like my my spanish uh i, I always want to pronounce like anything in like the way you would pronounce it in spanish cuz it's the only other language i speak um, right but the islands of sino una um is a i want to say like see i'm going to get this wrong and i'm going to feel so guilty about it i believe uh like philippines inspired Okay. Setting. Oh my god! Now I'm gonna look. Now we now we gotta do research. I know. God, I wasn't prepared th th for this. Thanks, Derek. Um, <laughs> I 
was right. It is inspired by the Filipino mythos. Um, and is a really interesting um, campaign setting for D&D games. Um, mm-hmm. I'm trying to think. I've, I've read a number of them that are inspired by I really love people taking, you know, like I'm on record as being like, you can't run everything in D&D. Um, but D&D sort of having that quintessential white European fantasy slash, we tried to throw some other stuff on top if we put everything in the pot, it's fine. Right. Um, but I am a really big fan of people bringing their own culture, their own experience to that game to show that yeah. fantasy is not just white Eurocentric medieval fantasy, you know, yeah, exactly. um, that, that doesn't have to be the default. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that one is really good. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. Um, I'm trying to think if I have a game in particular that stood out to me. I feel like, gosh, in the last two years, having read so many games, like, yeah, I, I feel like my brain hurts, like trying to think of stuff. People are like, <laughs> do you have any suggestions? And I'm like, uh, I know I read a bunch. Uh, like, <laughs> y'all, there were almost 500 submissions last year. This year, there were 730 something. Good. How do you read that many? Uh, I mean, the good news <laughs> is that not all of them are games. Like, not all of them are full oh, games. There's also adventures, there's accessories, there's, you know. That's true. Um, so, some of them are shorter. Some of them are like zine style shorter games. Um, I, but yeah, like it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Um, but there's also podcast yes. websites, you know. So yep. some things don't take as long as other things. But yeah, it does all mash together in my brain sometimes. It's like, oh, yeah. oh I know I do have a thing for that. What was it? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I would say for me, it's um, The Islands of Sina Una uh, by Hit Point Press. If you're looking for it, it is a D and D five E campaign setting. There you um, go. Super interesting. Yeah. So, and then yes, Coyote and Crow um, is inspired by a lot of Native American mythos, a lot of Native American cultural mm-hmm. background in that one. Um, again, that's also one that I have read but not played. So, um, not totally how sure like how it works in practice, you know? Right. Um, right. But yeah, very interesting, very beautiful book. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. I know that there are more. If I think of them, we can maybe put them in the show notes or something. But there you go. Yeah, it's my short we'll answer. That it <laughs> took eight minutes. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, here's my question from Kevin: uh, If Necromelia needed to be redeemed, how would Magical Girl Ryan do it? Oh, okay. I, it almost feels like it's the same answer: the un, undying uh, love. Undying bonds of love and friendship. Undying bonds of love and friendship. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Uh, I I mean, we covered a lot of Magical Girl stuff in the last Q&A episode. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think just showing that uh, necromancy can be more than just raising the dead. Right. And ra- raising the bonds of love and friendship is uh, really cool, too. Yeah. I mean, I feel like this question um, is kind of like under false pretenses, though, is like if Necromelia needed to be redeemed, which right. obviously she doesn't. She has no desire whatsoever to be redeemed. <laughs> How dare you imply that there's anything wrong with her to begin with? Exactly. <laughs> there uh, you go. All right. This question is also an anonymous one. Uh, favorite character you've created? And I like this caveat in here because clearly this listener has listened to our show. Or top three. (laughs) Or top three. Yep. Uh, I think that we have been pretty clear over the course of these Q&A episodes that we, A, are really bad at remembering what we have done. (laughs) Yep. And B, love all our children equally. (laughs) We do. Uh, Well. Fairly uh, equally. I mean, I I think I do have ones that like stand out to me more there, there's there's a bunch that i would say eh to um yeah, yeah i think I there are them. definitely ones that i'm like i would love to take this to a game and there are yeah. ones that i'm oh, like absolutely. Mm, they're fine yeah. yeah exactly like um my D D character from series one um uh, i think they were just like a generic monk i think i remember character. the name of like 
the practice one that I made, but I don't think I remember the name of like the <laughs> I, don't even, real one. I don't even know what you made. I don't I don't it's been so long. I think I made like a I think I made a druid in our practice one. Okay. Um Tess Greenleaf. <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember at all. Um, um Yeah. But goodness gracious. Oof. Um um, I, I mean, for me, h- high up on the list is the the thirsty sword lesbian characters that we made. Yeah. Um, just because that game is just fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, which which uh, recently, as of the release of this episode, what a month and a half ago, won something. Uh, yes. pretty prestigious. Yeah, they won a nebula, which is yeah, like that's pretty sweet. Insane. Yeah. Um. Yeah. <laughs> It's like not a small deal. Yeah, for best writing, they won a nebula. Yeah, um, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so that one, um, I really enjoyed um Dirge. I oh, mean Dirge, Dirge. Stranglethorn has to be on the top of my yeah, list. Yeah, I mean there's no way that you can't put Dirge on the list. Dirge was life changing <laughs> for you. It's life changing. <laughs> like seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gosh, I, I could probably think of a third one, but this is where it gets kinda kind of difficult i think i want to put beatrice from our masks game i know i keep bringing up that masks mm-hmm. one um i just really loved those characters so much um yeah. ooh, i feel like like if we're going through like i mean just this favorite so like i don't know yeah like this is, so hard. This it's is like, like, it's of, like of all time right? right even off of the show right so like yeah, I would have to put my oh, oh, the OG. I guess Mishra. it does just say that you've created, so that yeah, doesn't so, have to be right. Um, so I'm gonna say OG Mishra uh, yeah, from Heroes Unlimited. I don't, I don't feel like I want to go that far though. I mean, I guess in which case, like, <laughs> like I would have to put my my first L five R character is that yeah. to me on that list. If I'm just sticking with the show stuff, I honestly really love my character from our Unbound series, Luminance Edge. Uh, oh, yeah. My Street Fighter samurai with a fluorescent light bulb <laughs> sword. Um, yeah, yeah. That was a very good character. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed that. I, I'm really bad at remembering the names of my characters, though, because um, I, I really enjoyed my my pirate magical girl uh, from that series. Yeah. Uh, oh gosh, what was her name? It had like a sky theme to it. I just mm-hmm. like re-listened to these ones not that long ago too. Right. Um and then of course Alchemistresses was uh was a fun character. Yeah, like I'm I'm struggling not to just like pick recent ones because those are the ones that are fresh <laughs> in my mind, you know. Um So I mean it I says mean, or top three. So like I've yeah. named my favorite or top three. I was like top there two, like go. we'll meet you in the middle. How about that? Top exactly. Two. There's too many. I, I, I gave probably like six or seven characters. I don't know. I'm like waiting for people to write in and be like, what about this one? And me be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I did forget about that one. <laughs> they were, they're all fantastic. Right. Right. It's fine. I mean, I did really like her brilliance in our Chimera game. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so, so many hard. good characters. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> let's let's go to the next question. I think we answered that well. Yeah, enough. I mean, I think I think we get very clear, concise, <laughs> like all these questions. You, you, and you, like <laughs> two hours later, yes. what was the question? I, I'm still talking. <laughs> all right. Uh, this question is from uh, Fabian. Uh, how do you deal with the fact that there are way more cool RPGs coming out than you will ever have time to play? I would say that I slowly cry myself to sleep many nights <laughs> wondering, will I live long enough? Will Is I there enough peanut enough? butter and jelly sandwiches in the world for me to <laughs> eat that I could live long enough uh-huh. to cover all of these games? No, honestly, it is. Um, I'm not going to say I lose sleep over it, but it is definitely something that like eternally frustrates me as somebody who yeah. is polygamous. Um, that there's just not enough hours in the day. Like, even if this was my full time job and I devoted yeah. my life to RPGs, um, there's no way that I could ever play this many. Just oh, because no. it, you know, like even if you did a four hour block for one game every day for a year, there's 365 games. There's 365 games, and that's not even scratching the surface. 
gestures yeah. wildly to the giant shelf behind me. <laughs> it's, it's like you can play all these games, but like at what point does it just become a like, I, I don't know, I, I, I almost want to say chore, right? To just power through yeah. them all. Right. Like, yeah. like, are you I even really enjoying say, do what you them? love and you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. And I say, do what you love every day and you won't love it anymore. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. I mean, I think that the thing is like, it's, there are so many games coming out and like, even yeah. if we add the caveat that not all of them are cool to me, mm -hmm. uh, not all of them are, are Amelia games. There's still just like, too many too there's many. So many oh yeah yeah, yeah. there's too I many i mean that's that's kind of the curse of this show too is like and the blessing right because we want to cover so many games and we get 12 a year yeah you know um yeah we will never have like we will never be wanting for content to cover um yeah. only for time to cover it exactly yeah um and it, it takes time to get things together it takes time to do them and it takes time to like in, in this scenario, it would take time to to play them, and we would have to have a dedicated group and blocks of time, like even once a week. That's only fifty two games a year. I just sat down and had them. a session zero for my first campaign in almost a year. Yeah, it's wild. Mm -hmm. I don't play games. I don't get to like. I, I always tell people, I'm like, I talk about them, I uh -huh. read them, I am involved We're with them, but I don't play them. Yeah, we're we are both really in more of the theoretical portion yes, of yeah. game playing, right? Absolutely. And I understand the concept of games. <laughs> I do believe I that there are I people out there who occasionally play them as well. <laughs> yep. Uh we we dabble. <laughs> right, right. Um I mean you at least like work on some game design stuff too. I'm just uh, like I don't play um, them, I don't write them, but I will judge them. <laughs> Yes, uh, and I do have two groups going at the moment for two different campaigns. So, yeah. I mean, that's something. But, like, that's even then, that's two games. Right. Um, we're doing Beyond the Wall and Symbarum. Right, and those um, aren't necessarily, like, you know, like, they're not necessarily always weekly games. They're not, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the one I'm doing now is going to be a Star Wars game, and we're going to do every other week. Ideally, mm -hmm. fingers crossed, every other week. That would be nice. <laughs> um. Although I believe I have sold my group on playing Arium on weeks when we can't have everybody there because one of the big themes that we wanted to play with was like exploration. Um, oh, yeah. And I was like, what if we played Arium in between and made up our own planets? And everybody's <laughs> like, yes, let's do that. And I was like, yes, sold. <laughs> oh, that sounds amazing. So I was like, that would be a really good activity to have like a mini game in between on weeks when you can't have everybody there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That'd be amazing. Right? Right? I was like, oh. Well, especially for Star Wars, right? Right. Well, that was the thing. And especially after everybody said, like, okay, we want exploration to be a concept yeah. in this game. I was like, what if we made up our own planets? Yeah. Because so many people were like, well, I'm, like, familiar with Star Wars, but I'm not, like, deep in it, you know, enough to, like, know all the lore and know all these planets. And, you know, and I yeah. was like, all of the planets are dumb anyway. So, like, there's no way that anything we come up with is going to be worse than what Star Wars already yeah, did. Yeah, because it's all just single biome right. planets. This right. is the desert planet. Right. This is the lava planet. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and, you know, like, I'm on record as saying I love mini games within games to do those kinds of things. Yeah. And I, I think it's another way to get some more buy-in about, like, this is a planet mm -hmm. we're going to visit. We've established some things. I think it probably ideally will help our GM um, yeah. to kind of like go in with these hooks because in Arium you create like some people, some places, some concepts. My dog is barking behind me. Um, you create some people, some concepts, some places, so, like hooks for the GM to pull mm -hmm. on to. So yeah, none of this is answering the question about playing cool games. Uh, but is. basically I... I'm saying I have found a way to combine two games into one to be able yeah. to play more games. No, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I like that a lot. It it, it reminds me like if if uh, I could ever get Chimera to a point where I would start doing a space opera mm -hmm. module. Yeah. Um, the thought was you create the planets like you created your like origin planet right. and and whatnot yeah and so like everywhere you go you can you can either do it in like mini mode where you only pick a few tropes mm -hmm. and then see how that works out and 
or you could just go all in on world building for a planet. So like in those situations where you don't have everybody, you could just right make a planet. Yeah, I'm really big into anything that gives you the option to continue playing when people aren't there without missing things. Because yeah. I don't I don't love like just continuing with a session when you're missing a player. Right. But I also strongly believe that momentum is really important in keeping up with a campaign. That once you start missing, a, you know, a month or something because you're only playing every other week and like I've mm-hmm. had so many games fail that way because oh, yeah. it just gets hard to keep up. It's like, okay, well, if we don't play this week, do we wait two weeks? Do we mm-hmm. try it for next week? And then the schedule's like, you know. Um, and so anything that kind of allows you to still keep going without anybody really missing anything um but still keeping the momentum of that campaign to not just like switching to a whole different game so i feel like that was a good little um way to do stuff in between but yeah i don't know i think the answer is just i cry myself myself to sleep every night yeah and i tend to not think about it yeah (laughs) because it would drive me up a wall right right um i think the answer really is just denial yeah pretty much Um, yeah no, there's is a, a, is the most there's important. No, there's no, there's no games being released. What are you talking right, about? Right, I don't understand what you're talking about. Like, games? <laughs> what are, what I've never games? heard of her. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's no game. That's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. What system are you least looking forward to? Mm. I have no clue how to answer that. I don't either. I mean, because it's like even the. The new Marvel game, which we kind of talked about last time or the first time. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to it to see what it's about. Yeah, to but see. But I guess like, I'm what not like I'm not excited about it, I guess. I don't here's the thing is like I don't have enough space in my brain to hold all of the games that I am excited for. So I th- yeah. think that there aren't any that I'm not looking forward to because I've just like whoop, like just Yep. Like, there's no space for it. It just isn't. Mm-hmm. It's not on my radar. Right. Like, or I don't think that there of, are games that the... I've looked at and been like, Ugh, <laughs> that's terrible. Yeah. I'm going to keep track exactly. of that. Yeah. Or, or like, you could also look at this question and say, of all the ones that you're really excited about, which one are you the least excited about? And that just doesn't seem right. Well, that's a stupid question. <laughs> sorry anonymous what a dumb question <laughs> at least look at, i don't understand um uh-huh. no I, I because i think honestly like i can't even name ones i'm looking forward to uh-huh. like well because uh, see the last question for there's just too many games <laughs> right right um so yeah, uh, our answer I would mean, be like the an- <laughs> <laughs> um, because, dear listeners, I, I don't know if I've talked about this on the show before. I probably have, um, and a thing that I frequently tell my friends is uh, the brilliance of having ADHD is like out of sight, out of mind, right? Yeah. Um, which is a lot of times extremely frustrating, but sometimes it means that the world is full of surprises that I have kept even from myself. So very occasionally, what happens? I shouldn't say very occasionally, all the time, all the time, people, what happens is I get really excited about something. I'm like, oh, yeah, there's a new game. It's coming out. It's on Kickstarter. I back the Kickstarter. And then several months later, a game shows up at my door. And I'm like, that is a gift from past Amelia. Uh So, like, the idea that I would be, like, looking forward to, like, or, like, not looking forward to a game um, is bananas to me because I... Don't even look forward to the ones that I'm looking forward to because I've right. forgotten about them. Like uh-huh. there are games that I have like fully backed on Kickstarter. Like I know I'm getting the like mm-hmm. nice copy, the special edition cover, whatever. Yep. But like that's in three months and Amelia three months from now is not going to know yep. that she did Where that. this came from. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a big, exciting world. <laughs> I know. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, next question is, why all the blood magic? This is from Anonymous. So much blood magic. Okay. I actually, this is another one that I... Uh, oh, you took notes on this one? I believe I did. Let um, me get out my dissertation. Well, because I get <laughs> this question from people a lot about like, okay, really? you know, like enough with the evil stuff, you know? Um, that's 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 really funny. Okay. So I'll, mm-hmm. I'll read what I wrote here, and then I can kind of expand on it. 
I wrote because I'm fascinated with the subversive nature of dark magic and the idea the chan- of channeling our own life force. Also with the love surrounding dark and forbidden magic in a lot of settings. Mm. So, or with the lore, sorry, I can read my own writing. Also with the lore surrounding dark and forbidden magic in a lot of settings. So mm. one of the things for me that is really powerful about dark magic is that in a lot of settings, um, it is this sort of like dark mirror of what society thinks a person is supposed to be like. Mm. Um, particularly when you look at um, the Sith in Star Wars and also at um, Shirito in L5R. Both of them are about yourself and your relation to the world as opposed mm. to this like outward looking it's it's selfishness as opposed to selflessness and okay. i think especially in star wars when you look at the jedi um it is this idea of like what you are supposed to do for the world and right. the way that you use this thing to help other people at the sacrifice of your own identity and your own self and as someone who has gone through some struggles in life, who has had problems with their identity, who has been in an abusive relationship, um, the idea of reclaiming my sense of self and mm-hmm. doing something entirely because it is good for me um, is really important to me. Uh, yeah. Being able to say, no, I don't have to. And I think some of this is like, being a mom in modern society too which is the thing that I, t- I talk a lot about about like the idea that my identity should be nate's mom and not amelia mm-hmm. um but the sense of like i get to own myself and my choices and do things because they are good for me um and not just good for the world which mm-hmm. i think like we are we are raising this sort of like judeo-christian puritanical Society of like, I, everything I do should do should be for the good of everyone else and sacrifice myself. And like, that's not always healthy. Like we do it to an unhealthy degree. And so a lot of it for me comes from this like reclaiming of myself. Yeah. Um, there is definitely part of it that's just like, what a cool aesthetic. <laughs> um, right. Like, I'm not going to lie and say that, Got like... those blacks and reds and... Like, that there's not like, some part of it that's like, oh, you're secretly a little bit goth. Um, uh-huh. But there definitely is more to it for me than just, you know, like, <laughs> blood magic. Um, <laughs> and the idea that, like, you know, especially in, in blood magic, that, like, the force that I'm using to channel this thing is my own life force this isn't something Mm. that i am pulling from somewhere else that i am relying on another source again it's about myself and the power within me yeah and those things are very important to me yeah it's great so that is my that that is my thoughtful answer also the clothes just look dope the aesthetic is phenomenal and uh (laughs) extraordinarily uh yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like also it's great aesthetics. Like it's just yeah. cool. <laughs> it's um, just cool. Yeah. But there's, like, yeah, there's, there's, there's more a to reason it. why the villains like look the coolest in a lot of shows. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, uh blood magic looks cool. Mm-hmm. And uh self self uh self reclaiming. Self actualization. Of... Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Oh. I like it. Very cool. All right. Oh, that's right. It is my question. Okay, so on that note of, you know, like, really deep lore and understanding, mm-hmm. Ryan, vanilla or chocolate? This is uh, honestly a complex answer for me. Oh. Um, if I had to choose one, it would be vanilla. Of course it would. Ha! Of course it would. Um, simply because... Um, Don't be one of those choc- people that's like, it's actually such a really complex flavor. No, 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 nothing like that. Uh, it's it's <laughs> it's a nice, simple flavor. That's why I like it a lot yeah. because it's like um, if I want something like simple, smooth, and something that I can add stuff to, right? Vanilla is my go-to, right? Um, ideally, vanilla mixed with chocolate. Uh, of the twisty course, swirl. Of course it is. Of course it is. is Ryan, once again, folks, is at the top not of the list. making a decision. But <laughs> it's a decision. Like, there's a reason why when I go to Tom's and I get an ice cream cone, it's going to be a twist. Right? Because. Where's Tom's? 
Tom's? Oh, you don't have Tom's down there? Oh my gosh, so. Tom's Drive-In is uh, it's a uh, like a oh, a we burger don't have drive-ins place. down here, Ryan. Come on, this yeah, is the big city. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> this is a big city near Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> the big city, the uh, you know, population seventeen thousand. Yeah. Well, I mean, like even if I go to Culver's, I'll get vanilla and chocolate. Okay. But they'll just scoop them together, and oh. it's not as yeah. See, fun if I go to Culver's, I get a mixer. Yeah. So. So, yeah, All vanilla right. and chocolate is is my go to. All right, but if you had to pick one, you pick vanilla. I yeah, I'd have to. I mean, chocolate has too many varieties. Mm-hmm. That there's like. You know, darker chocolate, chocolate swirl, chocolate fudge, and you know, all this other chocolate stuff. Yeah, that but usually you can when you go chocolate. and get chocolate ice cream, you're just like, chocolate. I guess yeah. this question doesn't specify ice cream. It does just say it vanilla. It doesn't or chocolate. specify ice cream. But I don't <sighs> know, like, what other situation you'd be in where they're like vanilla or chocolate. Because, like, nobody hands you, like, a n- box of chocolates that's like vanilla or chocolate. They would be like yeah, white and, or dark. And, right? like, yogurt, you can get vanilla yogurt, but chocolate yogurt? I mean, you can. That- like, Yopi like, makes, like, a chocolate mousse yogurt. You can, it's not I guess. bad, but it's definitely still yogurt. Uh-huh. Um, um, which, by the way, I want to go on record as saying, y'all, frozen yogurt is not ice cream. Stop it. If you want to eat frozen yogurt, frozen yogurt is fine. That's fine. But stop pretending it's ice cream because oh, it's custard. not. Frozen custard is better than ice cream. Frozen custard, absolutely better than ice cream. Um, yeah. I also think ice cream is still better than frozen yogurt. I would regular frozen custard, ice cream, yep. frozen. Yogurt. I would I'd frozen custard, ice cream, frozen yogurt. Right, um, right. And I don't, I don't know if I've had enough frozen yogurt to have a good opinion on it, but I do know it is lesser than ice cream in terms of and like uh, experience. Right, like for me, for sure. I think like if if you love it, you go for it. You know, like mm-hmm. I know people that love frozen yogurt, but stop telling me that it is a replacement for ice cream because it is not. It Fro-yo. is not. I'm so oh. Mm. Okay. <laughs> you love froyo. No. <laughs> no. Just because you can put toppings on it. Uh-huh. No. Okay. Yeah, maybe I avoid. I I come to think of it, I don't know if I've ever had frozen yogurt simply because people kept calling it froyo. Mm, that's a good reason to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's. I had that's not the case. had a ton of it. Like I'd had it here and there when it was like the only option. Um, and then my sister did work at a frozen yogurt place for a while, so we would go oh. every so often. And like a lot of them have school fundraisers and stuff. Okay. Um, although they do seem to split it like fifty fifty between like is it at Smart Cow the frozen yogurt place or is it at Roberts the family owned custard establishment down the street in which case yeah. for sure going to Roberts yeah um that's a whole Get other that situation custard. here that people don't really need to know about the answer for me is definitely chocolate um if you look at my pinned tweet right now that has like all of my bio information the very last yeah. one says that I do not like roller coasters I think vanilla ice cream is boring and flamingos are my favorite animal. There you go. Um, so I felt important to not like that it was important enough to put in my bio <laughs> yep. that I have a pretty strong opinion on it. Well, there you go. But I have stronger and- opinions on frozen yogurt than I do on chocolate <laughs> or vanilla. So <laughs> uh, we go. just lost well, a lot of listeners right there. It's, it, no, it's uh, but fine we're from because- Wisconsin. So, you know, yep. we have strong uh, opinions we- on these things. We know dairy. On dairy based desserts. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, well, welcome to dairy, uh, delicious dairy discussion. Yep. <laughs> D3. D3. All right. Okay. Next question. This one's from Derek D. Uh, any tips for making NPCs that fit in settings, but aren't too tropey? Um, yeah, actually, I think for me, um, a thing that I've said throughout the course of this show over the last four years is that characters become characters to me when they have flaws Mm -hmm. and so i think you can make the tropiest npc in the world yeah but like if you add some flaws to them as a person it starts to take away from that um provided that the flaws are not like part of your trope right right Um, which is where my love for random tables absolutely comes in that's that's what i was gonna say i when i did um very short stint of running D and D. All the NPCs I created. There was this random table. I can't remember what book it was in. I think it was a three point five book somewhere. Um, you could roll. Sure? No, it was a it was a D and D three point five book. <laughs> I 
<laughs> um, <laughs> like, duh. <laughs> Come on. You fooled me before. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> no, but there's a random table for like random NPC quirks, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so you could you could go to this table and be like, roll it up, and oh, this person has a stutter. This person has um, like a nervous tick, um, or this person has you know like or or, or you know whatever has like a mole yeah, like or some whatever kind of that they're conscious or- of. Defining yeah, something, or something like, like that. that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was great because, like, I could roll up an NPC and and or or ha- say, "Oh, you meet the shopkeeper," and roll the table and and play them however it rolls up, right? And that right. gives them this nice little flavor. Um, usually, it's kind of you know uh, something memorable, or like a flaw or whatever that that the NP or the characters will remember. Um, it did uh, throw them off when I rolled. This person is nervous. They thought they were hiding something. Mm. They're just socially awkward and nervous. Right. But it's like it happens, they were they were literally just uh, just a guild master that was socially awkward and nervous. Yeah. And what do you want? Mm-hmm. It's not they're not up to no yeah, good. I mean, that's like that's the one thing about players, right? Is that like every so often they look for things that are not there, and you're like, no. Yeah. Y'all, no. Um, I'm playing through Wonderlands right now. Uh, it's g- great game. Cannot suggest mm. it enough, especially if you love the Borderlands games. Wonderlands is phenomenal. Um, but it does, there are a couple missions like that where, like, Tina is playing the Bunker Master and she's, mm-hmm. you know, she's like, okay, you meet a guy in a blue hat and they're like, seems shifty. And she's like, no, he's just a normal guy in a blue hat. And they're like, no, we got to find out what he's up to. He's probably up to something secret. And like <laughs> this whole mission of like chasing this guy around. And she's like, guys, there's nothing wrong with him. He's just a normal guy. And like, what it was so game? relatable. <laughs> like, oh, So then I she like ends up, you know, legs. like making, she's like, fine. You, I don't know. Find a secret door, I guess. <laughs> like, oh. it's just <laughs> because like they won't let it go. Uh huh. And it's just, it's, it was like, wow, that's like the most relatable gaming experience ever of like players oh, being amazing. like no there's definitely something here and you being like no <laughs> there really <laughs> isn't i cannot really stress not. this enough he is normal <laughs> just he's just a little different than all the guy. other boring npcs yeah yeah uh-huh um, yeah uh I, I think random tables are are your friend in the, these scenarios honestly like, yeah definitely you- um i think because it does you, you can't be tropey when you're just randomly picking things you know and and be up front with your players too. let's say hey uh i'm rolling random personalities for some of these characters that you're meeting don't look into it too much <laughs> you know i love uh, that you think that that's gonna stop them so like the moment I you're understand. like don't it look into li- it, it, pay no attention to things. the man behind the curtain <laughs> <laughs> right but i mean if you if you have a table of open communication right, right. and like a lot of things are uh quote unquote on the table uh, then it's going to be uh, a little bit easier for your players to just ignore some of those random quirks that that make NPCs people instead of just I'm the tavern person, I'm the shopkeeper, I'm I'm the guild master, I'm right. the town guard. Right. It's like no, this is the town guard named Jerry that you know has hiccups like ninety percent of the time. Mm-hmm. He's got a wife and three kids at home. Yeah. Dealing with some financial issues, but you know exactly. they're keeping their heads up. Exactly, <laughs> and like literally two, two or three random tables, you can get all all those sorts of little details. And goodness gracious, uh, flesh out those NPCs definitely uh, pretty pretty easily. Definitely, and there are like whole books that are just you know for creating NPCs and personalities and things like that. Yeah, um, and and if Amelia ever gets on it and makes those tables of random hats and and scarves and other accessories, yes, that's um, true. That's true. Sells them on itch for yeah, a dollar. Yeah, put them on itch. <laughs> yeah. I want them have to all, all be like you have to like use a different method every time for like this one is like you must pull Jenga blocks from a tower. However many you pull and then it falls down is the answer on the table. And then this one's just flipping a coin. And then this one is like <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> they gotta be easy. Well, I'll make two versions. There you go. Yeah. This is this is for the advanced, right? Uh, quote unquote, real yeah. gamers. Yeah, this is for advanced Dungeons <laughs> and Dragons, right? <laughs> advanced D and D five E. Yeah. There you go. Um. All right. This question is from Kevin. What does it mean to ameliorize 
or Ryan Ranificate <laughs> your D and D game. Um, Ryan, what does it mean to Ryan Ranificate? Ryan, okay. Ryan. I want to say like Ryanificate, but that sounds like Pontificate, which is like not <laughs> right. Right. Ryan, but like Ryan, ameliorate Ryan. sounds like ameliorate, which is like a whole uh-huh. different thing too. So yeah. Uh, what does it mean to okay. Ryanificate your game? So I feel like um, Ryan eyes. Might yeah, be. Ryan eyes. So traditionally my games if i'm if i'm home brewing stuff you can like be 90 to 95 percent assured it will involve multiple dimensions at some point oh interesting yeah either you're gonna be uh dimension hopping at some point or going to another world that's alien and unknown previously to the civilization that you come from um all all sorts of things like that if if i'm running like a full campaign of sorts Mm -hmm. you know somewhere in there that's going to happen um because that that gives you the option to blend genres and now you're in my nonsense yeah that's fair i do want to point out that the word ameliorate which is is spelled like my name Mm -hmm. um does mean to take something bad and make it better Oh, so nice. I just want to like point out that we could we could go ahead and like it doesn't have to be ameliorized. Like we can we can ameliorate. Um, <laughs> in my opinion, <laughs> in order to ameliorate D and D, in my games, it it is really about there not being a clear definition of what is right or what is wrong. Mm. Um, not because I'm like go nuts. Nothing is ro-. like there's no rules. Um, but rather because I think some of the fun is in having to make difficult decisions Mm -hmm. and having to like, I think a game is most interesting when it is not prescriptive, I guess, Mm -hmm. when it's not clear, this is the thing you have to do. And, um, I, I think when we, when we infuse games with like a really strong, like sense of morality or something like that, it, it takes away some of the fun for me because it's like, okay, well, it's obvious what you want me to do here. It's mm-hmm. like, I guess we'll go to the thing, you know? Um, yep. Whereas, like, playing in that moral gray area forces me to really think about, like, why am I making this decision as a character? Um, um, and forces a little bit more role play and um, complexity on a game. So, yeah. so for me, it's really about there not always being a clear right or wrong about having consequences to even good decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think it opens a lot more avenues for, for role play yeah. and for like, like decision making for me as a player. Can, can you imagine like a villain that is so into that, like I'm doing the right thing and they're so convincing about that, that the heroes join them? Yeah. I mean, instead like, of stopping them. Right. Like, wait, wait, you're doing what? Yeah. For, for what reason? Right. Oh, Right. I mean, I have, like, really strong feelings about, like, when I play L5R and you're playing this, like, samurai upper class in a feudal society of, like, I'm not the good guy. Like, Uh I'm not, you know. Um, And that's a really interesting zone to play, especially, like, if you, like, with the caveat, like, if you actually play in that zone. You know, if you don't make the assumption that, like, I'm here and I'm the good guy and any decision I make is the right decision and, you know, like... I like being able to play with that of like, okay, like yeah. I'm socially doing the right thing, but morally, is that correct? You know, like mm-hmm. this is expected, but is it really yeah. right? You know, um, so that, in my opinion, is how you ameliorate yeah. a bad game. Well, plus, why wouldn't you join up with the person that has the cooler aesthetic? Well, right. I mean, that's like the important thing, too, is like, you know, <laughs> uh, I don't, <laughs> there's a Star Wars episode of Phineas and Ferb. Um, where like Candace is is a stormtrooper. Um, she there's a song about like in the Empire, and she's talking about it. And then like there's a line in the song is like, "Plus I always look so good in white." <laughs> like, <Yep. laughs> um, I just think about that. Like, I you yeah. just like look cooler. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, next question is from anonymous. Uh, if you had to do a podcast about something unrelated to RPGs, what would it be about? Ryan, it's time to talk about our accidental <laughs> podcasting moment. Uh-huh. I'm waiting for this it, question. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell me about your thesis. 
Yeah. So Ryan and uh, I both independently had this thought and like didn't say like I'm I've like never said it out loud because I'm like if I say it out loud it's real and I have to make a podcast. Uh-huh. Um but for a long time I've really been fascinated with like the really niche topics that people yes. pick for their capstones and their theses and to like focus on in school. Yep. And so for me Mine was about voter t- participation in European Union level parliamentary elections. It yeah. was like, if we give more power to the European Parliament, which is the only directed, directly elected body in the European Union, do people then, one, participate more in parliamentary elections, and two, view the European Union as being more democratic? That, mm. was, my, that was my capstone project, oh, right? Nice. Um, the answer is no. <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> um, it is a it is a deficit of caring, not of democracy. I forget huh. how I how I worded it. It was more right. eloquent than that. But since then, I've been really fascinated. With, like, why do people choose the weird, specific stuff that yeah. they choose? And we were having a conversation at one point where Ryan's like, "Yeah, I really want to start a podcast where I just like ask people about their theses." And I was yeah. like, "Me too." I know. Ah. <laughs> if we had time. If we had my time. My goodness. Yeah, that was one Seriously, of those. Like, if would, our Patreon makes enough money, someday, I would love it. pie yeah, in the sky. Like, if, 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 if we could get it to a point where we just had to record it and like Yeah, throw like it could out pay there somebody else to edit it or whatever. Yeah. Because yeah. those ones like wouldn't have to be six hour, you know, be like a one, one yeah. done kind of episode. Oh, um, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we could we could easily, honestly, get away with one hour recording with one person once a month, and release on a monthly cadence, and those would be the easiest things to edit. Right, because like, it's just like, discussion. It's like just... I could probably get it done within an hour. Right, tops. Right. So this is our pie in the sky dream that we accidentally had once again. Yeah. It's the same podcast idea. Um, <laughs> and it was like this aha moment of like, if only we had time. Right. I know. But this Seriously. has been our, for both of us, I think for a while, a dream podcast of like, please tell me about. Yeah. Let us get excited. Thing. Like, Let us get excited about the thing you are excited about because like there's nothing better than that contagious joy. Right. Of like listening to somebody in their element. Like it's, it's like the pure human experience, like soaking that in. Yeah. And for and, me, I think. Like, on the other side of it is also just, like, the fascination of, like, how did you end up there? Like, how yeah. how did you get so deep into something that you were like, let me look at Eurobarometer statistics to see which people in which countries feel that the European Union is specifically democratic so that in 2010, you can write your capstone thesis paper and write that <laughs> the UK does not care about the European Union. And if ever a country was going to leave, it would be them. And then a few years later, it's like, ta-da, I was right all along. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know why you were right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just think that that was so funny that we had this moment of like, we both want to start the same podcast. Like, we can't. We cannot. We absolutely we cannot. We can't. We can't. Not right now. Um, maybe, maybe but once like, the kids who, are in, is it really maybe. hard to like both be holding each other off? Yeah. Like, and who's to say? I mean, like someday. six years from now, someday. Uh, 10 years from yeah, now. Yeah, if we've been doing this I'm, forever, like four or five years. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. We'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe next year. Maybe next year. <laughs> I say, like, no, like really, if like if we have a Patreon at a point where like we can, you know, and I yeah. like, have more hours in the day and, you know, whatever. I don't know why we'll, money we'll is what... the thing. It's not. It's, it's not. not. It's literally time. <laughs> it's literally time. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Next question is from Daryl. What are three RPGs you haven't gotten to do yet, but are extremely looking forward to creating characters for in their systems? Ooh. We've answered this a little bit. I know Ryan wants mm-hmm. to do Wander Home, Lumen. Yep. yep. Something else. Ah, uh, gosh. Um, probably Coyote and Crow. It's on there. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I really would like to create characters in the Dune RPG. Ooh. Um, because it also has house creation. What? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm so for that. I'm gonna put that on the list. Um, yep. Uh, I also am like really interested in the Fallout RPG because it oh. is not a game that I would want to play. 
Um, yeah. Because it, it does have some inventory management stuff, which we've discussed. <laughs> but it is exactly what I would want a Fallout RPG to be. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in creating characters in it. Um, just because I okay. do, I do love Fallout, and uh, I just want to like mess around with it without having to mess around with it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are, I think right now, like the ones that have been kind of on my brain. Um, I really want to do Dune. Having only actually read that book, I've only read the first one. Um, you know, the important one. Uh, like in the last <laughs> couple of years, I guess. Right. Two, 2020, I read it. Um, when I was not working full time mm-hmm. read a lot of books and i finally read dune um and was like oh okay i see why this is like the quintessential you know like yes it's problematic but i see i see i right. see why it had the effect that it did um but the game is very interesting hmm. uh what else yeah color me intrigued yeah um i definitely think there's some others that i'd, I'd like to play around in like city of mist really interests me oh, okay. um is one that we haven't gotten to look at at all yet um, and I'm not um, super we familiar did, with the base. At least I it, did a uh, spotlight on that one. Of, on City of um, Mist? City of Mist way back. In, that was, I think, our first spotlight. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah, that was a while ago. Hmm. Um, but I think um, it was. But yeah, it, it, we didn't create characters. Yeah. However. Right. Uh, but yeah, it looked really interesting. That was the one with the, the with the playing cards. It's like PBTA with playing cards, if I remember correctly. Okay. I am. Yeah. Yeah. No, I guess you did way back in 2018. Yeah. Yeah. That was a while ago. Okay. Or a little baby uh, segment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was like spotlight. August of 2018, and I was like, oh yeah, I was like, hm. right, like, uh, I think while I was uh-huh. gone at Gen Con, maybe. Yeah, I um, think so. Like <laughs> peak, like a month before I got divorced. So yeah. I was like, maybe like a little busy. <laughs> um. Go. So okay, maybe not that one, but it seems interesting yeah, that- to me. There's there's a lot of good games out there, yeah. uh, as we've established multiple times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then um, also, like obviously, we would love to cover some, like maybe more classic White Wolf ones. I'd really love to cover Vampire or something at some point. Yeah, eventually we'll get yeah. there. Yeah, just because it's interesting. Uh, yeah. Speaking of Vampire, um, this next pack, uh, this next question comes from Mike. Uh, it is uh. I feel like sometime in the 90s, the future of TTRPGs was a battle between Vampire the Masquerade and Rifts and Vampire 1. What? That, those are words uh, we'll have words about. At least yeah, I it's interesting because I I think... It kind of did, though, It honestly. did. Like, I think... Here's the thing. is like, I think Vampire 1 long term. I think short term, it did not. Right. I think there was a big surge in Rifts and games like it that were really yeah. crunch, like really skill heavy but i think long term vampire is the one that has held on so. yes so the question continues um have you noticed a movement in ttrpgs to remove crunch from games i'm thinking of a simulationist systems like heroes unlimited versus more storytelling games like masks or am i just an old man who came to ttrpgs via war game strategy games instead of an old man who came to ttrpgs from a creative background no, I don't think that you're just an old man. Uh, right. I no, this is no idea how old you are, but I think absolutely this is the trend. trend. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because like um, the 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 narrative of the RPG uh, design experience, it really had been crunch up until uh, almost the PBTA era began with uh, with Apocalypse World, right? And I believe that was early on, if I remember correctly. Um, and once that started catching on more, that that sort of narrative play just became more ingrained in the indie sphere right. of, of game development. And then that kind of moved even further. And even some of that is kind of seen in D&D 5e. Um, they got rid of a lot of crunch from 3.5. They did. They did. And, and now 5e is much, much more streamlined um yeah there's a lot way. fewer skills there's a lot you know like yeah. we're doing a lot less with percentages and you yeah. know all of that kind of stuff too yeah absolutely um and i know uh i know back in the day riffs uh goodness gracious uh was a, a behemoth of a system like i 
I can't even imagine utilizing all of the world books, all of the dimension books, all of the source books, all of the like source books of source books. It's like ridiculous, let alone the main books and then the conversion books and the <laughs> right. it goes on and on. Right. But think about that, though. Like you're not doing that with D&D 5e either. Exactly. You know, like even if you look at just official books for D and D, there's tons of them, and you're not you're not using all of those. Yeah, so. and I mean, uh, riffs they they did come out with Savage World riffs, yeah. right? Um, so like utilizing the same sort of setting using the Savage World setting, but which, again, uh, that's that is a much lighter exactly. system. I I think that's the thing is like getting rid of the complexity to make games more appealing to a wider uh, breadth of people i think that they're yeah i think it's um i think it's a combination of things i I think that yeah it is it is about appeal to newer audiences making them easier for people to come to i also think it is this um surge in indie designers that Mm -hmm. you have games being made by people who are not lifetime game designers that they're not people who's who's brains are working in that same space of like i design games and that's what i do you have people who are like okay like i'm a lawyer in my day job or Mm -hmm. you know i am in tech i am you know like anything um yeah the variety of like day jobs of people that we've had on our show has been um astounding and it makes it more approachable for people to work in those spaces i also think that we have had a rise in the sort of like toolkit kind of systems um you know like the 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 ogl has been around forever right yeah so like people have always been able to muck around in, in that um but now there are so many versions of that that you mm-hmm. can play around in and and obviously like, a variety of legal frameworks around those things, right? Like who owns Mm -hmm. them and, you know, like what happens if you make something in Genesis is very different than like what happens if you, you know, do something in Lumen um, or Cortex or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, But you have the ability to utilize more of those, like not everything. It was like, you're either working from the ground up or using the OGL. Whereas now it's like, okay, is it PBTA? Is it Cortex? Is it, Mm -hmm savage worlds is it you know like there's just so many options for people yeah. and i think as more of them become narrative um we see you know like breed like right right so like as more systems become narrative and more of these toolkits become narrative mm-hmm. the games overall are continuing to be more narrative so i don't i don't think it is just yeah. that you are an old person i have no idea how old you are mike um i feel old sometimes so unclear, but I, I don't think that you are wrong in seeing that pattern. I absolutely think yeah. that games are becoming more and more focused on storytelling. I, I think mm-hmm. that I think because we're delineating, because like war games and RPGs were kind of like this same connected, mm-hmm. like same different versions of the same thing, right? Yeah. Um, and now it's like. Are you playing like they, Warhammer they, they the split, mini game right. or are you playing Warhammer the RPG and they're totally different? Oh yeah. Thanks. hundred percent. You know. So yeah. um yeah, I think they've really split off from each other. Mm-hmm. To and be and two it's not to say things. that there's not a place, right, for, oh, for uh, sure. like a hardcore strategy uh, RPG out there, right? Right. Um it, and I know And a they few do them, exist, yeah. Yeah, there are a few that exist and there's a few that are coming up. Uh, I know the Marvel one. Uh, we keep talking about that one's supposed to be like heavily in the crunch and and heavily strategic. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what that's all going to entail, but you know, uh, it's it's just one of those things. I and and like you said, the toolkits, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the being able to make games from an existing system that's out there, like. It makes it a lot more approachable for new designers. I feel like if I were going to make a game, that's absolutely the route I would go. Yeah, because I've got this idea for like a world or I've got this idea for implementing a certain genre or whatever. And it's like, well, what framework is going to fit that? I mean, I say that and like I, you know, the little bit of game design I was doing was like not even in a toolkit system. It was just like, I'm going to reskin a game. (laughs) Like, yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. So it's. 
I don't know. Yeah, the barrier for entry for game design is much lower than it used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that you have the internet, it's much lower to even sell these games. Yeah, and I so, think, yeah, that's another thing too, right? Is that, you know, it's it's easy for more people to get their hands on those games too. Yeah. So I think it is a variety of, of factors. But yes, I do think that they are going that direction. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Kevin asks, what rules or mechanics make it distinctly ryan or amelia ish oh interesting oh what rules or mechanics make it distinctly ryan i mean i guess uh collaborative world building uh rules Mm -hmm. uh big for me um i mean if you want to roll into my nonsense completely anything that that like gamifies the blending of genres or uh magical girls yeah it's fine yeah i don't know about like if there are like specific mechanics, I guess for me, it is do mechanics advance story. Yeah. I think that's what really does it for me is that like are the way that you interact with the numbers in the game mm-hmm. or is the way that you interact with the numbers um, telling of what you're doing there. Yeah. That's really where it's at for me. I think so, too. Yeah, absolutely. Because like there's there's nothing more disappointing than. I'm going to do this really cool thing. My character is going to be amazing in this and you roll and fail. Right. And and the result of that is you fail and that's it. And now this is the next person's turn and that's so Like you're just boring. trying the same thing. Okay, like yeah. you roll perception. Now you roll perception. Now you uh-huh. roll perception. It's not interesting, no. right? No. But like in games like PBTA, it's like, oh, you roll this thing that's equivalent to perception, say, and you fail it's not just a fail. Now the GM gets to throw something wild at you. The story gets turned upside down. Um, and, and now you have to deal with something totally different that you didn't think you had to deal with. And it's part of the narrative. Uh, I am going to also shout out to my BFF L5R here. Um, <laughs> and actually uh, Cortex does this as well. Um, approaches. Big fan I of approaches. I love approaches. Um, yeah. If what you roll is determined by what you are trying to do. And especially in those like perception or investigation kind of checks, if the information that the GM then provides is different based on how you went about doing that thing. Mm -hmm. So in L5R, when you like, you know, roll with air, you're doing things in sort of like a roundabout kind of tricky way. If you do it with earth, you are doing it in a, you know, sort of like stalwart kind of Mm -hmm. thoughtful way. Um, right. And I like when you then have to role play, you know, so that you can't walk and be like, I walk in and do this. I roll with earth. It's like, no, you don't. Um, mm-hmm. You can't always roll with your best stat. So yep. uh, I really like, again, when the mechanics enhance the play. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, literally look at how I designed Chimera and that's that's me in a game. Yeah. Right. Like it has all it has approaches, it has collaborative world building, it has magical girls, it has like uh Yeah, well we said mechanics. Know, narrative consequences. Not... Magical narrative girl consequences. is not a mechanic. I mean, there's a transformation mechanic. Well, that's so, not really wait, like... uh, it's in there. Whatever. It's a stretch. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Next question. Brian can't just uh, keep think... saying magical girls world building. That's not know, that's fine. not a mechanic. It's on repeat right now okay next question um i apologize if we do not get this name correct uh niels martin strom uh josephson uh please uh, please let us know if we got that correct or not um this one is uh when preparing a game with say four pre-generated characters do you have any advice for character creation Boy, howdy, do I? (laughs) Yes, we do. Uh, Allow players to make some choices. Yes. So when I ran L5R at conventions, I um, shout out to Katrina Ostrander, who is one of the designers of the game and did this in her game um, and kind of gave me the the tools to do it myself. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I created the character sheet sort of playbook style so that people could... Uh, kind of finish the character. So basically what I did was like, I made them halfway and then said, you know, instead of like, okay, pick 10 skills and then put them over here. I was like, you can pick from this or this, Mm -hmm. you know, instead of handing them a book and saying like, go, you say, okay, do you want A or B? 
um, yeah. just enough to kind of like flavor things. So when mm-hmm. you get to that point of like advantages or disadvantages, give them a list, let them circle, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's enough to let people like you, you lead them right up to the finish line. Yes. Um, I also suggest if you're, if your question is more like, how do you make pre-generated characters? Um, give people sort of a variety of options. Mm-hmm. I think um, if you're planning on having four players, maybe have like six characters. Yes. Um, and give people like a taste of like each thing that you can kind of do. And yes. it's up to you, I guess, whether you are like, okay, we can have two wizards or like only one person can play the wizard. Mm-hmm. Um, but just remember that like, you know, not everybody at the table wants to do the same thing or, you know, people do have yeah. their preferences, especially when you're playing with pre-generated characters. You want something that feels kind of like in your wheelhouse, I yeah. think. Um, I I also like the um, the pre-established relationships. Um, as well, like when I go to a con game and we pick up the characters and we have to get into play right away, right? Mm-hmm. And here's your pre-gens, which one do you want? Then I can see, oh, this character is the best friend of this other character oh, at the table. Oh, I don't like that. Um, I, I do like that in terms of like, okay, now I get to role play this thing. Like one of my most memorable experiences was a 10 player, two table game of Cypher system. Mm-hmm where we had to travel uh, it'd be back and forth between the past and the future and, and all this other shenanigans. And then the tables got mixed up, but like my character was just this veteran soldier that I was like, I don't know the system. I'm kind of shy to playing in conventions. This is my first convention. Um, I'll pick the easy character, right? Mm -hmm. Turns out this guy was a father to another character that at the other table. Gotcha. And I was like, this person is your son. And I'm like, I don't know. This person is not at my table. I guess they're probably at the other table because all the characters are taken. And then once those met up, now I had this huge hook on how to play with this other character. Yeah. See, as somebody who's like super socially awkward, I don't like that because it's like the potential of like, okay, now you have to like link up and role play with this person that you don't know. And like, I feel sort of like... Like, I understand that, like, in some instances, it definitely could be, like, a way to get people to talk to each other and, you know, Mm -hmm. like, that kind of stuff. But also, I'm like, okay, now I, like, am tied to this person. I don't know what their role play style is. I don't know. So, I would honestly go back to, like, the sort of, like, leaving blanks is have some of those links, like, available to people, maybe. Yeah. And, like, let them pick if they want to do it that way. Um, right. Or or make them less severe. Like my first con experience was with Numenera. And it was like when you use your fire power, this other person's fire that is constantly there turns your color. Interesting. So it's like my fire power wears green. So whenever I use my fire power, somebody else's character's fire turns green as well. Yeah. And it's like there's just this like weird little link that doesn't technically matter, yeah. but it. It's a fun little thing. Yeah, I think, I think like, you know, we always talk about like having those relationship questions too. I think it's a good, Mm -hmm. um, they don't take a lot of time, but you know, like letting people kind of build some of those too. Um, Yeah. I think um, if you leave those blanks, it's probably good. Preparing pre-generated characters, I think my advice is just like, make sure you have a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, And then, like I said, um, kind of get them like, 75 to 90 percent of the way there and then let other people do the mm-hmm. rest yeah and it depends on your story too if right. are these characters going to be integral to the story that you're going to be presenting or does it not matter who the characters are and the story is going to happen you know how you had prepared it and whoever is there like if there's a rogue or not it doesn't matter right but like with the rogue it opens up this other avenue without the rogue it closes that avenue and it's not a big deal right Mm -hmm. because it really depends on the game you're playing um if you need a balanced group or not if it's going to be like a combat heavy game you you don't want a bunch of characters that are not going to be combat capable yeah yeah all that sort of stuff right right and similarly like if you have a game that's going to be like investigative maybe don't make a character that's like super combat focused because i'm like that's going to be bored um 
Yeah. Yeah, I definitely and keep in mind the kind of game that you're running when you start making those characters because absolutely. you want to make sure that every character type has something that they're going to be able to do and do yes. well for the advancement of the story. That's absolutely. definitely a mistake that I've seen yeah. people make is that like you give somebody the, you know, the duelist or whatever, but you have no duel in your story. Like, yeah, you know, you, you, every character has to have a chance to shine in the story that you're preparing. Yes. Yes. Um, and so if you have six characters, all six characters need a point that you can have them shine completely within that story. Mm -hmm. um, at least one major point. Yeah. Um, and if two of the characters aren't chosen, it has to be fine that those two yeah, major points are Yeah, make sure the story can move forward up. without them. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a both pre-gen characters sort of thing, plus also story generation, right? Yeah. Yeah, I feel like we didn't really make it easy there, but that's our advice, right? Like, no. <laughs> you know, um, it's it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. But, um, yeah, make sure and, that your your story and your characters fit, whether people pick them or not. And, again, yeah. I think anything that gives players at least a little bit of buy-in um, yeah. and, and lets them sort of make their characters their own, even if they are yeah. pre-generated, is going to go a long way. 100%. Uh, next question. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Of course you get this one. <laughs> uh, how is a Ninja Turtle not a magical girl that just uses ooze to affect a transformation? I don't know, Jude. It's not. This is one of those, like, is a okay. Pop-Tart ravioli? No. I'm not answering this question. The thing is what it is. A Ninja Turtle's not a magical girl. Please go yeah. away. Okay, so 100% <sighs> not a magical girl, and I'll tell you why. Oh, my God. Please don't dignify him with a response. <laughs> no. No. We are professionals and Jude is not going to derail this with nonsense I know, questions. because that's what he wants. What he wants <laughs> is us to fall apart. You're right. Please give him a well-thought-out answer, because that will make him the angriest. So, how is a Ninja Turtle not a magical girl that uses ooze to affect a transformation? This is the thing. Magical girls have two-way transformations. They transform into their oh, magical good forms, call. Good and call. they transform back. Okay? And it's it's usually at will, or... Within a certain time period or amount of effort, magical expenditure, yeah, some kind or of um, whatever factor that, yeah, yeah. Um, the ooze, from what I understand, and I could be wrong on this, it mm. transforms from one creature into the like humanoid version of said creature, right? right? Granting them sentience, right? They don't and... un ninja or un turtle, exactly, or un mutant. Yeah. I guess really is the part. Right. Now, on. there might be some storylines where they have de-evolutionizing ooze, but even then... It's that's, not a central focus of the story. And, it, like, it's, balancing it's, the difference between being a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle and just being, like, a regular teen or a regular turtle or a regular ninja yeah. isn't part of the story. It's not a part of the story at all. No. Yeah. And they they it, it might have some self-discovery or whatever but like it's not the main focus of the teenage mutant like, just stop it it's not the right line. genre just stop it it's not it's not it's, it's not. a superhero genre it's and not. it's 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 a subgenre of superheroes just like magical girls is a subgenre of superheroes but completely different in terms of tone and themes and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. plus the ooze doesn't you can't transform back i mean i feel like that's really like the important part here is you can't yeah. transform back it's a mutation. Exactly. It's a permanent mutation. It's not yeah. a yeah. Yeah, you're not just transforming. It's just not for magic. A it's just gross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. That's just science. That's just science. That's just science. Mm -hmm. Take that, Jude. <laughs> That's the All last right. of his questions. Thank God. And, <laughs> that we know of. Watch, he'll he'll have submitted one anonymously, and we'll we'll have to answer that. Yeah, it's fine. All right. This next question is from Danny. Uh, which character the other person has made do you think is the most like them, i.e., Ryan, which of Amelia's characters do you think is the most like her and vice versa? Oh, man. Um, so uh, your your Masks character probably uh -huh. is high up on that list. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that for sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say our Alchemistress's characters. <laughs> Okay. Where are we immediately? I was like, you're water, I'm fire. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's just like right away. Um, 
I yeah, I mean, I think that those might be aside aside it. from like the uh, the the jock portion right of the character because I am a hundred percent. Oh, I mean, I wasn't a theater kid either. Right, but like personality wise, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, I'd say personality wise for for sure. I mean, I don't think like I've shied away from. I mean, like I know I'm supposed to be answering for you, but um, I don't think I've shied away from making me as a character yeah. at all. Her, her brilliance. Her brilliance. Wow, really? That's the one you pick? That's the one you pick? The self-centered, like, great, great, great. Just kidding. Love it. Um, no, I, definitely your best character. The the fiery, like, um, type of personality, but, like, uh, you know, really grounded as well. And I think because that's what's fun for me to play is, yeah. like, I know that they are like me, but I think that it's... Um, it's a more confident, powerful version of me. Right. And, um, and like, again, again, it's, it's fun for me to play at the table. It's fun for me to like, be able to inhabit something that feels comfortable. Mm-hmm. That's what I want to do. There you um, go. I feel like we've made a lot of characters that are, a lot are like similar that. to us though. Um, and, and some characters very not like dirge. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel like I've stretched my legs all that much. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, you've you've thrown some heroes in the mix. I have. I've tried to make some like nice, genuinely yeah. like sweet people. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Okay. This question is an anonymous one. Uh, Ryan, why is Neptune your favorite? All right. Um. So, is it time for less, your thesis now? So, um, less of thesis. Yeah. This is. Okay, I did my blood magic to... one. This is your thesis <laughs> time. Back to the Quake One days of the internet. Um, okay. Like mid to late 90s i'd say 96 97 period of time um i was playing quake one um online a little bit with my modem and my keyboard only no mouse whoa and okay yeah and i was also obsessed with sailor moon of course Mm -hmm. um and i found a group that were playing as the identities of the sailor scouts in their team matches so like you would you, you were able to like skin your character yeah back then so you would be able to upload any skin to your character to look however you like but it's still the same boxy character right but you could Just pick colors and stuff yeah colors and and outfits and everything so right yeah. like um and they had customized uh sailor scout outfits uh for the quake character and it was ridiculous amazing. looking but it was amazing um so I, I joined up and I was like, I, I definitely want uh, uh, my first pick would have been uh, Sailor Mercury. And my life would have been 100 percent different at wow. that point. Right. Because water based. Right. Sailor Mercury was the the original water based Sailor Scout. And I was like, oh, that's that's so me. She's brilliant. Uh, she's amazing. I just and, can't imagine you as like anything else. Right. So but Sailor Mercury was taken. So I was like, well, what's the next best thing? Okay. Um, Sailor Neptune. And I was like, okay, Sailor Neptune. I don't have much experience watching Sailor Neptune in the anime because the U.S. episodes only went so far at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but the more I, uh, more I read about Sailor Neptune, the, the, the intelligence, the, the grace, the, uh, the uh, violin playing, uh, piano, art, uh, she does painting. Like, like all this other like cultural stuff that's just like, that's, I love that stuff too. Yeah. And it just kind of all fit. And then from there, it was just all downhill. And I just, I just went from uh, SMC, uh, the Silver Millennium Clan, Neptune, uh, to Sir Neptune in various places. And then I wanted to get a little bit more fierce. Uh, so I went with Lord Neptune instead. Okay. Um. So it was more intimidating of a username when I joined Quake 3 servers and whatnot. Wow. Um, and and from there, uh, Neptune's become my absolute favorite because, like, you know, the teal and the, the cerulean mm-hmm. color mix is just phenomenal. And and plus, she's uh, she's amazing. And she's a, a lesbian icon. So what do you want? <laughs> wow. Yeah. I'm, like, shook. I can't believe that it wasn't always Neptune. Right? Isn't it wild? 
Who would you be today if you were Lord Mercury? Oh, I don't even know if that would exist, honestly. I don't know if I would have, because Lord Mercury sounds kind of weird. I don't know why. Would this podcast even be here? <laughs> life what is my be. life now? <laughs> what is uh, every, there was, a, there was a major inflection point in my life that would have diverged absolutely everything after that point. Yeah. Wow. I don't know. Uh, the, the fates were kind to me, I guess. I guess so. Joined, joined at the right time. Wow. I know. Huh. So there you go. Okay. That's why. Okay. Uh, plus, Neptune's a really cool planet. Sure. There you go. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> uh, Kevin asks, what is a Ryan or Amelia themed D&D supplement book look like? Um, yeah. I mean, I feel like we've kind of touched on some of this. Mine, well, not really. I guess we've, we've, we've touched on yeah. our themes. Mine definitely um, is going to talk about like dark magic and, oh, and yeah. things like that. But I, I think it's going to do it in a more nuanced way than what yeah. is currently available in D&D. I don't think it's going to and- look like a lot of like chaotic evil and, you know, um, that I think that that is something amazing. that D and D definitely lacks with its alignment system mm-hmm. is like any sense of nuance or subtlety. Yeah. So I think that would be something that I really want to focus on. Um, and, and, and obviously be... the economic implications of raising the undead. Absolutely, as, 100%. as I've been on record as saying. <laughs> uh, I mean, mine would have to be genre bl- genre blending nonsense again. Um, I, I really think uh, magical girls can fit very well in a D and D environment. It's a uh, class that uh, is is not there. It's it's akin to warlock, but like in a different sense. Yeah. And I'm wondering if uh, if if it's its own class or if it's if it's a subclass of warlock, right? Magical uh, girl. Yeah, because I can I can kind of see it working both ways, right? But it's not like a pact between anything. It's not a purposeful pact. It's like a destiny sort of thing, right? Yeah. So it would it would almost have to be its own class at that point. Um, and and I think you could do a lot of fun things with it. Um, and a lot of th- fun things with turning various uh spells into like cantrip level things, mm-hmm. where you could just keep casting fireball or whatever um but like that's all you get and and you can only do it while you're transformed interesting i don't know something like that i think that'd be a lot of fun to add to D. um it, it certainly wouldn't be a vroom vroom level of absurdity yeah but and it wouldn't be magical girl the the race selection right right um i think that's that was wrong. Be like a whole class yeah, it would yeah. be a class that any any race could become a part of and yeah. And uh and it would you would just be a destiny based instead okay. of like whatever. So destiny magic, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Might definitely That'd be, be like more like a, a thesis on yeah. uh, the use of I think yours magic. would probably sell better, honestly. Uh, I think so. I don't like, know. Like there'd Mine be a lot a of people academic. that'd be into that. <laughs> eh. Well, I mean, <laughs> still mechanics of like adding nuanced blood magic and necromancy to like D and D player characters, yeah, uh, would be phenomenal. Yeah, it'd be fun. I think so too. Um, I think we got off a little bit, but we'll keep uh, rolling with yeah. it. That's fair. That's fine. I asked uh, two in a row. Had, sorry, you did. That's fine. Has your favorite genre changed since doing C3? Has your perspective or things you like, dislike, want, don't want, in and about RPGs cha- changed since doing C3? This question is from Anonymous. No. Gosh. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I feel like, so we, we did, a, when we talked about our, or we did our, uh, when we redid our episode zero, we talked a little bit about this, about like, yeah. you had this sort of change of like, liking things to be a little more complicated and yep. and things like that. And I honestly don't feel like I've shown the level <laughs> of growth as a human that you have. Um, I know. Well, because you were, you were already creating complex characters, right? Um, I mean, yes. Um, I think we just kind of came from like different backgrounds to it. Like yeah. I didn't start playing until later. Um, mm. 
and and like I played like one campaign when I was in high school and then I didn't play again until I was an adult. So right. it wasn't it like it was already, you know, like I was a parent and you know, life mm-hmm. was more complicated, right? Yeah. Um no, I don't think that I've, I don't think I've grown as a person. <laughs> uh no, because I, I still really love like cyberpunk. I really love Oh yeah. Um sort of space magic y kind of things. I like, you know, like I still don't I'm not really into the traditional fantasy. Um mm-hmm. No, I don't. I don't think it has. I think the answer for me is just no, it hasn't. Um, and that's fine. That's uh, yeah, fine. I mean, I, I think like I want to be like, oh, I've like learned so much. And, and I have. Yeah. I have. Like I've been exposed to a lot of new things. But I think more than anything, it's sort of solidified that I, I like what mm-hmm. I like. Yeah. I mean, I'm willing I, to try I, more things. And, you know, like I, I see, I don't want to mm-hmm. say I see the value in things that I didn't before because I, I, I think I did. But um, I've gotten better at like understanding why other people like those things maybe Mm -hmm. um but as a as a general rule no i don't i don't think my stuff has changed much yeah i for me it's definitely reinforced some things right um and it's it's definitely like um opened my eyes to a bunch of things as well obviously um like adding the extra complexity to characters uh is is definitely great Mm -hmm. um but like um before c3 i didn't really think about RPGifying magical girls um it, before C3 it was like uh riffs uh fantasy worlds uh and and cyberpunk and superheroes and that's all i really knew uh for RPGs um c- cyberpunk is still well up there on the list of one of my favorite genres to tinker around in though because of you know, the anti-capitalist nature of it all and everything, but like magical girls, you know, that that's, that's just top, top tier yeah. right now. So why not? Right. Why not? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I had to laugh because I it was, it was discovering, I mean, it was like maybe a year ago that I had this conversation, but when Jude and I first became friends, like five-ish years ago or whatever, I like the running joke was that he was like really into like evil things and I was like not. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And then like as time went on, I was like thinking about like the books that I like and the things that I'd read and like the stuff that I did. And I was like, oh, actually, I was just in denial. Yeah. Like actually, I really love dark magic. And like one Mm -hmm. of my favorite book series was like about necromancy. And like Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, (laughs) so yeah, um, there was a time when I I pretended that this wasn't who I am. But Mm -hmm. It is. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. I'm okay with that. I, I that's fine. I I I have all that goodness inside of me, but I also have a soft spot for uh the the allure of the dark side. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. All uh, right. My question um, or your oh, question? Whoops, now? I did not I accidentally okay. did this one. Okay. Uh, a movie studio yeah. finally takes the bait and offers to make a movie about your characters. Which series oh. do you pick to go on the big screen or small screen if you prefer streaming or a TV series instead? This one's from Danny again. Uh, yeah. Answer number one, Danny, actually our series, because why is it not a Hallmark movie, Danny? Why? Uh, <laughs> right. Why is our Christmas Belonging series with this sweet yeah. honey kiss in you know, uh, in the like time gold travel pinned. nonsense. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like gold pen. Like gold pen. I already made up a whole soundtrack for it. I know. So, um, ah, uh, it is so good. It's so um, good. yeah. Um, other big blockbuster type. Well, the other one uh, obviously our, is our Inspector series needs to be a TV series. Like Inspector I know that that's. Series, I know that I picked the two TV. that were already like based on TV shows, but like I think those yeah, are like yeah. clear winners, right? Right. Um. For for the other one, like Unbound comes to mind. Yes, would be fun. I would absolutely watch that. Yeah. Like that aesthetic was just like Chef amazing. Kiss. Yeah, uh, CRT punk is I think we yeah, called it. That's what we called it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that'd Agreed. be amazing. Uh, the, yeah, too many of them. Yeah, gosh, but yeah, I, there you go. I I, th- I think those are our top answers. Yeah, I would say so. Absolutely. All right, we got only a couple more questions left. We're a little over in time, but I think we can power yeah, through these last three. Yeah, I think that like, at this point we should, yeah, for sure. All right, 
Uh, this question comes from Ian. We all know that in general, point by systems are not where it's at for you. Honestly, same. But what sort of character creation system features would it take for you to give point by a try? Um, now, I'm more point, pro point by than you, I think. Yeah, well, because it involves math. Yeah. Um, so I, I honestly love a good point by system where I can min max the heck out of a character. Yeah. Where I can be like, okay, if I if I buy these things and then I give up, uh, you know, these uh, uh, flaws and to get more points, um, then then maybe I can get this other thing. And then here's this really cool character that uh, that can, you know, one shot everybody at level one or something. OK, you know, something ridiculous. I, I would like to just min max the heck out of it and. Especially if it's like a strategy based sort of game, right? Yeah. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I mean, so like here's the thing, it's like I'm not totally against point by. Um, for me it really is just like about the math. Yeah. Um it just needs to I think my biggest problem with point by systems, honestly, and I think trying to make a Star Wars character recently solidified this, is that when there are very clear answers about how you should spend your points, right? Like there's clearly a right mm -hmm. way to do it. Um, you know, somebody in our game recently was like, okay, can you just like remind me like how to do it? And I was like, yeah, you put all your points into characteristics and then when you have two left over, you buy one thing from your skills tree, right? Right. Like that's just how you like, <laughs> ta-da, solved it for you. Um, right. And so I think that's my my big thing is that I want there to be, like, I want it to really be up to me. If you're going to let me buy things, yeah. if you're going to give me a system where you say, do whatever you want, I want to be able to do whatever I want. I want it to no not be... No trap options. Right, right. Um, yeah. Because, like, with the characteristics, it's like, well, you can't level them up later unless you complete a full skill tree. And you, you know, so it's like, yeah. well, okay, you've just had, like, you give me all these points, but I'm not yeah. really, and like, why didn't you just say, like, more... here's four things, split them among your characteristics and yeah. call it a day. Exactly. And I, it, uh, a pet peeve of mine is, hey, if you upgrade these during character creation, it's cheaper than if you do it during advancement. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, then, of course, I'm going to upgrade them during character creation. Right. Why wouldn't I? And now I'm missing out on all this cool stuff because you're telling me I have to upgrade the boring stuff for more price later. Right. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. I so I think know. it's like if it's going to be point by, I want it to truly be a point by and truly yeah. be my decision. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And make it fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, All right. Second last one. Here we go. I know. Uh, this question is from Mix. Why? Not about CCC or anything, just like at all. Yeah, why? Uh, when this question came across our Discord, my answer was, why not? Why not? Um, and I feel like that's. I'm going to stand by that. I had a fifth grade yeah. teacher that would put that on the end of tests. He would, he would put why. And the right answer was, why not? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, wh why not indeed, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, w I, I had a more succinct answer to this last night. Um, I was like, oh, I'll save that for the recording. But then I just forgot about it all. Um, honestly, it's, uh, it's, it's good to uh, instead of not. And so why not? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, <laughs> that uh, plus blood magic that. and magical girls. Right. So why not uh, follow follow your bliss? Right. That's why. Yeah. Seems, there you seems go. reasonable. Nice life advice thrown in there. Right. Follow your bliss. Got it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the final question. Uh, the question that we didn't randomly put here. We put it here at the end because it just made sense to. Uh, this is from anonymous. Uh, what question do you most want someone to ask of the show? I don't want the answer, just the question. I love that. And I, th I think we put this here because uh, it was very difficult to get through this uh, question. It was like the fourth one that we asked originally, and I cut that out. Uh, right, and right. Because I think we were end. like, well, let's answer all these other questions and then see if there's anything that we still want to be asked. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't I don't know. There was a lot of really good questions. I think so. Uh, I mean, I really over these three episodes really like these were some thought provoking questions. There were some that were really yeah. difficult to answer. Some that were just like fun, you know, but um, question do you most want someone to ask of the show? 
Yeah. I really, I really liked um, all the questions that came in. Um, I don't know. There, there, there's probably a lot more questions that you can ask. I'm, I'm always curious what, uh, what fans are curious about. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I know I'm mostly an open book about whatever. So, uh, if, if you, if, if we do this again next year, um, or in another four years, uh, you know. Just keep an eye out for when we have that forum open and and throw some questions our way. Um, I I, do, I don't I, think I, mean, I have we, anything else. I want to have a good question about. This, but I don't. We had questions about favorite sandwiches, but not about favorite foods in general. Uh, favorite TV shows. We haven't heard anything about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we could use more questions about like us as people. Hey, maybe. Yeah. maybe. Um, I think so. But you know, that's also like not really relevant to the podcast, so. Yeah. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with like the way things were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it worked out I, well. Honestly, um, thank you all for this. This was um, almost 60 questions here. Yeah. So, so it was really good. Yeah. Somehow we got through uh, like almost 60 questions worth of uh, questions. This is uh, wild. Yeah, truly. Uh, I, I, we really appreciate the amount of support that everybody has shown us over the years. Um. I think with the with this episode, it wraps up our official four year uh, anniversary celebration. Yes, uh, which is coming out at the end of June, um, and I'm I'm really thankful for everybody that's been with us over these last four years and everybody joining us uh, recently. Um, it, it truly makes means the world to us that you know people care about the thing that we're doing here and. Uh, that it's it's more interesting than, um, you know, than not. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I love that people have, have been on this journey with us and supported us. And um, I say it a lot, but like we, we wouldn't still be doing this if people didn't care. Um, yeah. I don't do it just for like the numbers or anything, but there's definitely something satisfying about knowing that it resonates with people. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's yeah. been a lot of fun, and I'm really looking forward to to not having to cry myself to sleep at night because <laughs> we've covered more games. That's exactly. Yeah. We, we get to learn more about the games. We get to make some characters, and we get to play a little bit of fanfic mm-hmm. uh, with them and every series, every month, and uh, it, it makes us happy doing that. It does. Absolutely. Uh-huh. So I'm... I'm excited to see where this next four years is going to go. Um, I'm excited to to see what the next four months are going to go because, you know, goodness, we've got a lot of games that we want to cover and we just need to figure it out. Yes, for sure. So, um, yeah, we're just coming off of Series 51, which as of this recording hasn't started releasing yet publicly. Um, but uh, you can get the first episode, uh, if not everything uh, of our future series, uh, you can get them a little bit early on our Patreon, which is, uh, I think, really fun. Yes. Um, and uh, so so check that out and uh, check us out on our Discord because we really like uh, talking with all of you. Uh, we noticed that there's a, a few newer people that have been uh, more active on our Discord lately, and we really appreciate that. Yes, that's um, awesome tra- to see new faces. And- yeah. Get a chance and, to and talk with people. We're trying to be a little bit more active on there too, and and uh, hopefully we can get some uh, some good discussions there going as well. Mm-hmm. Agreed. All right. We'll see well, you I next think that time. About, that about wraps it up. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning or on my other podcast, Garbage of the Five Rings. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs, 
and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by the absolutely fantastic Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game system used in today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you'd like to support our show, find us on Patreon. Get access to bonus episodes, extra outtakes, and much, much more at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Iron Ada Reforged, Puppet Strains. Ragnarok is coming, and it's you. Join creator Tracy Barnett and performers Alex Flanagan, B. Zelda, and Jeff Stormer as they navigate a Norse cyberpunk city to accomplish their ultimate goal, the fall of the gods. Part actual play and part playtest. Puppet Strings gives you a look behind the scenes of the development of Iron Edda Reforged and into the minds of four amazing designers.